Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to part two of my ultimate BVR Fox 1 guide for DCS World. This part will focus specifically on the MiG-29 and also outline some of the key differences between the current version of the MiG-29 that we have in DCS World, that is the Flaming Cliffs 3 version, and the real aircraft and also the full fidelity, hopefully the full fidelity MiG-29, which is soon to be in DCS World, because unfortunately the current implementation of the MiG-29 with its HUD symbology not only makes it extremely difficult to do some things, but is also completely wrong compared to the real aircraft. So if you want to find out, stick around. <music> The biggest challenge of the MiG-29, at least in Flaming Cliffs form that we have at the moment, is figuring out the gimbal limits of the radar for an effective crank. Unlike most other aircraft, the MiG-29 does not have a typical B-scope radar display, which clearly defines the outer edges of the radar's scan zone. The MiG-29 pilot manual states that the diamond cube must be kept within the limits of the HUD display in order to maintain a radar lock. The current version, the Flaming Cliffs 3 version, of the MiG-29 does not function correctly. The main difference between the real aircraft and the Flaming Cliffs 3 version is the fact that the diamond on the real aircraft does not represent the target. In real life, the diamond cue actually shows you the direction into which your radar antenna is pointing, and this will not align with the target. In fact, in real life, the target itself doesn't actually have a HUD symbol over it. The only time that the diamond will realign itself with the target aircraft is if you were pointing directly at the target. The radar antenna is actually offset somewhere between the center or the nose of your aircraft and the target itself. It's somewhere in the middle. So the only time they will align is if you actually turn back onto the target and position it directly off your nose. In real life, the pilot actually uses this diamond cue in order to be able to crank the aircraft at the maximum crank angle whilst maintaining a radar lock. The reason it works in real life is because the diamond cue doesn't actually go beyond the outer edges of the other HUD symbology that we already have, such as the altitude, the pitch bars, uh, the speed, etc. And in real life, the diamond on the HUD does not actually slew into the direction of the target relative to your pitch attitude or your bank angle. In other words, irrespective of how you maneuver your aircraft, whether you roll or fly upside down, the diamond cue will still represent the direction of the radar antenna and therefore actually the direction to the target but only relative to the heading at the top of your HUD, not relative to your attitude. In other words, what this means is that if you were to fly the real MiG-29 and hopefully the new upcoming full fidelity version of the MiG-29 DCS world, you should be able to use this diamond cue in order to be able to position the aircraft at the maximum crank angle whilst maintaining a radar lock and also know exactly where that crank angle is because the diamond cue as stated in the pilot manual for the real MiG-29 will only be able to move up to the outer edges of the HUD display symbology, not like we have in the current Flaming Cliffs 3 version, where the diamond actually goes so far outside the rest of the HUD symbology that the pilot must lean into it to even see it, never mind the fact that actually it's representing a completely different thing in the Flaming Cliffs 3 version, which is the target itself. So in this case, the question arises, how do we actually position the aircraft at the maximum gimbal limit for a crank in the Flaming Cliffs 3 version of the aircraft since the diamond cue is not used for this purpose? Well, the radar gimbal limits in the Flaming Cliffs 3 version of the MiG-29 is actually represented by the, this big circle in the middle of the HUD. And as you maneuver the aircraft, you will notice that this circle starts to position itself relative to your aircraft in the direction of the target. Once this circle has reached the outer edges of the HUD display, then we know that the radar is at its maximum limit. Now this can be a little bit finicky and a little bit difficult to predict, especially as when you position it right on the edge, it can stick there for a few more degrees in the turn, and it, therefore it's very difficult to pinpoint the exact plus and minus 65 
degrees azimuth that the radar is capable of cranking. So one, I suggest taking a reference heading off your target when you start the crank and use some mental arithmetic in order to be able to position the aircraft broadly speaking within about plus minus 60 degrees uh, relative of the target's azimuth. But also pay attention to the circle in the HUD as once you position this on the outer edges of the HUD display, this should more or less represent plus minus to the maximum radar gimbal limit. The only thing to note is that in the real full fidelity MiG-29, you will not have the right edge of the HUD displayed in any way because you will not have any numbers there, unlike we do in the Flame Cliffs 3 version. So in the full fidelity MiG-29, you will often have to use the head down display, that is the little screen on the right hand side of your instrument panel, which actually mimics the full HUD, but actually gives you somewhat of a representative uh, maximum right and left edges of the HUD to play with. Uh, and that should be used in order to be able to position the aircraft at the maximum gimbal limit. Now the other very interesting thing about the real aircraft versus the Flaming Cliffs 3 version is that unlike the Flaming Cliffs 3 version which can crank the radar up and down plus minus 60 or 65 degrees depending on what you read and where you read, the real aircraft does not have the ability to gimbal its radar up and down in the same way that it can in azimuth, in other words left and right. So depending on the source and where you read it could be anything from minus 36 or minus 45 degrees up to a positive of 56 degrees. What this means is that once you roll the aircraft in a hard bank in order to crank, you will actually not be able to reach the maximum crank angle on the azimuth limit, which is plus minus 65 degrees. What it actually means is that once you've positioned the aircraft at the maximum gimbal limit of the radar, uh, up and down and obviously that would be down when you're pulling away from the target in a level turn and then you roll wings level you won't actually be at the maximum gimbal limit of the radar of plus minus 65 degrees in azimuth. The other important feature of the MiG-29's radar that is very important to note is that once you have reached or gone just outside the gimbal limits of the radar the HUD symbology on the right hand side will start to flash. The radar will go into memory mode for approximately 4 seconds and if you manage to reverse the crank and pitch back into the target to get the target back within the radar gimbal limits, within 4 seconds you will be able to reacquire a hard lock. However, if you are guiding a FOX-1 missile at this point, when the radar goes into memory mode, the missile will lose its tracking. And it is important to note that apparently in the full fidelity version of the MiG-29 or the real aircraft, if the aircraft does exceed the gimbal limit at all at any point, you will lose lock completely. The MiG-29 pilot's manual states that in order to make an optimal shot, the pilot must align the cross in the center of the HUD with the circle cue. However, as discussed before, it is possible to loft the missiles manually in DCS by ignoring these cues and simply pitching up a number of degrees before shooting the missile. Whether or not this is actually a tactic that's ever been used by pilots in real life is up for debate, and unfortunately I have no information on this, and certainly the MiG-29 pilot's manual does not mention anything about manually lofting the R-27. I suggest utilizing the TWS or TWIS track while scan feature of the MiG-29's radar which can track up to 10 targets simultaneously. This will allow you to keep situational awareness on other targets while you're still tracking the bandit that you want to engage eventually. Once the bandit comes within maximum shoot range, the TWS will automatically switch to STT or a single target track at which point the bandit will get an indication on his RWR that he's being locked up by you. The radar switches to STT mode automatically because this this is the mode required in order to be able to make a FOX-1 shot. And this is true of all aircraft, not just the MiG-29. The downside of being an STT or single target track is the fact that you lose situational awareness on the other 10 available targets. It is important to utilize the correct PRF or pulse repetition frequency of the radar in order to maximize its potential at tracking targets depending on the situation. Just as most other aircraft, the MiG-29 has high, low and interleaved PRF modes. These can be difficult to remember in English as they don't really explain anything. You just have to remember that targets which are heading towards you or nose hot require a high PRF radar setting in order to detect them at maximum range. And similarly, targets tracking away from you or flowing cold require a low PRF in order to track them effectively at the longest distance. 
Interleaved, as the name suggests, is a mix of the two, which can be utilized in situations where a target's aspect is not known, especially during intense maneuvering by you or the bandit. In Russian, the HUD symbology and nomenclature makes it very easy to remember the correct PRF settings, as the Russians took a far more practical approach to the situation and named high PRF as PPS or Perenia Polosfera, which literally means frontal half sphere, or ZPS, Zadnia Polosfera, or rear half sphere, and AVT, Avtomat, which you guessed it, means automatic or interleaved. Obviously, during an intercept, the AWACS will report whether or not the bandit is nose hot, and therefore, in most intercept situations, a high PRF radar setting is most useful. If you ever think the target is turning cold, don't forget to switch the radar into low PRF unless you have already acquired and maintained a lock.